Good morning, everybody. My name is Justin Terrell. I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Justice Research Center. The mission of the Minnesota Justice Research Center is to transform the Minnesota justice system through research, education, and policy. Uh, we believe simply, as our founder, Tom Johnson, did that if you, is that people have shared values as it relates to the justice system. If you put data behind um, those values, that we can create a policy pathway to shift the actual structural systems that govern our justice system. And so um, I'm excited to welcome all of you to this conversation, this part two of the, uh, or continuing the conversation from our conference this fall, um, talking today about the impact of monetary, uh, the impact of the use of monetary sanctions by the justice system on our communities. And um, I, I just gotta say with all the stuff going on in the world right now, um, that it's a good reminder that people made problems can be solved by people. And that it's important that we come together that we talk about how the experiences that we're having with our justice system and that we work together to, to, to shift it, to reflect uh, what we actually want, to get the outcomes we want, to um, make sure it is more effective, to make sure it is more humane and that it operates with the people's trust. And so with that, I'm excited to have our guests back with us today, our uh, Kevin Reese, uh, Alexis Harris, Chris Eugen, Anna, Anna Odegaard from uh, the Assets Building Coalition. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Artika Tyner wasn't able to join us today, um, and, but we're gonna continue this conversation and talk about some real opportunities um, that we can work on together as a community. So if you're joining us uh, for the first time or if you attended the, con the conference, thank you for, for tuning in and, um, and, supporting, and supporting the work of the Minnesota Justice Research Center. So I'll kick it to my guest. We'll just jump into things right away. We'll do, uh, we'll have a presentation from, from Alexis and we'll have um, discussion from our panelists. There'll be time for Q&A towards the end and we'll close with the closing discussion and um, talk about what's coming next from our organization. Um, so first I'll, I'll ask uh, Kevin, would you like to just quickly introduce yourself, name, title and organization? Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Justin. Good morning. My name is Kevin Reese. I'm founder of Until We Are All Free. Um, human justice is something that's important to me because my experience with the, particularly with the criminal justice system, I spent from 18 to 32 years old inside a Minnesota correctional facility. So any opportunity that I get to talk about how can we reimagine justice, I'm always there. So I'm excited to be here this morning. Thank you, Kevin. And I'll turn to uh, Dr. Alexis Harris. Would you please introduce yourself? Good morning. I'm Alexis Harris, a professor at the University of Washington, uh, in Seattle, Washington, uh, in sociology, and I do research on monetary sanctions. Thank you. Uh, Chris? You I am Chris Eugen. I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota in sociology and law, and I also do some research on monetary sanctions. Thank you, Chris. Anna, please introduce yourself. Yeah. Good morning. I'm Anna Odegaard. I'm with the Minnesota Asset Building Coalition, which is an advocacy organization. We've been working over the last few years to advance criminal justice reform initiatives at uh, the Minnesota State Capitol. And I'm just really pleased to have been invited to join the conversation this morning. So once again, I wanna thank all of you for joining us. Um, the topic that we're taking on this morning is, is such an important one. People feel this topic in their pockets. People feel it in real time. And so it's important that we dig in and we talk about uh, you know, this issue and how we can help transform it in the experiences of our people. Um, so I'll kick it to Alexis. Um, if you, uh, you have a presentation, I'd, like, I'd love for you to share with the community um, for the next about 15 minutes or so. Perfect, I'll go ahead and um, start the slideshow. There we go. Um, uh, again, I am Alexis Harris. I'm excited to share my research with you. I'm just going to jump in and there's four sort of areas that I'll talk about. One, defining monetary sanctions. What are we talking about here? Uh, review briefly my research in this realm, the research I've conducted along with Chris uh, Eugen as well and other uh, collaborators. Talk a bit about the policy implications and then this has been an opportunity for me to really reflect on my ideas around monetary sanctions and the work I've done with others. So I'll, if you'll indulge me a bit, I'll reflect uh, on the framing of these issues. So first, when we talk about monetary sanctions, generally we think about the fines or the fees that are uh, sentenced to people who become entangled with the criminal legal system. But there are a lot of different categories. So there's restitution with the aim to make the victim whole. 
Uh, there's a fine that are assessed in Washington state. For example, we have a fine for a first time drug conviction of $1,000. Uh, second subsequent would be $2,000. So that's meant to be a punishment. And then there's fees. There's the criminal justice user fees that you pay as you go, essentially, for different types of charges, for a jury fee, for uh, the, your defense that was appointed to you because you could not afford one. Many uh, jurisdictions end up charging individuals for those people, uh, for your your um, uh, paperwork and court processing. And uh, some states have surcharges on top of that, so a percentage on top of the principal that you're charged. Um, many states impose uh, interest. We had 12% interest on everything uh, up until 2018 in Washington state, and now it's 12% on restitution moving forward. And then there's costs. There's per payment costs. So when you go to make a payment, you pay additional costs in some uh, jurisdictions. Many people call these uh, poverty penalties. If you can't pay the amount in full at the get-go, when you're sentenced to them, then there are these subsequent costs. So essentially poor people end up paying a lot more uh, for the same types of offenses that wealthy people pay. I also want to just, you know, highlight that the, those buckets that I listed out are in addition to all of the other types of costs people pay throughout their entanglement with the criminal legal system. So JPay, video visitation, emails, tablets, uh, the uh, exorbitant cost of, of commissary items when people are incarcerated to just supplement needed food or hygiene products. Um, and then there's punishment related costs. So if I'm sentenced to drug and alcohol assessment, I have to pay that. And my punishment isn't fulfilled, my sentence isn't fulfilled until I pay for those services. Well, what if I can't afford it? Um, so many of our punishment uh, also come with a price tag as well. Um, so this is a, a picture of my book and I'll just do a, a brief summary of, of the ideas. It's called a pound of flesh, monetary sanctions as I wanted it to be permanent punishment, but it's right now monetary sanctions as a punishment for the poor. Um, so if we think about the broader system of mass uh, incarceration and conviction, the folks who are uh, incarcerated tend to be the, uh, the very distinct population. They're disadvantaged pre and post conviction and incarceration. And with the system of monetary sanctions, I suggest that the process perfectly labels stigmatizes, financially burdens, and imposes further legal consequences to poor people, specifically poor people. Uh, it perfectly sorts the already marginalized and further cements them to lives of inequality, permanent lives of inequality. It allows for, in addition to perpetual state surveillance, looking for folks in communities, particularly poor communities and communities of color, looking for warrants, looking to get uh, cit citations. Um, so perpetual state surveillance, intervention, and control of poor people. Recognizing the system as a mechanism of our criminal legal system really highlights the two-tiered nature of uh, the system of justice in America. There's one system for uh, wealthy people and one system for poor people. Um, it's the recent uh, research project that I've done uh, was from five-year multi-state project. We were in eight states. Chris Eugen was the lead in Minnesota, um, and there was a host, you can see the other collaborators here. But what we did is we really replicated and expanded the work in my book on Washington State. And so we did interviews with people who owe debt judges, prosecutors, defense attorneys, probation officers, and clerks. Um, we did surveys with all people interviewed, and then we did observations within courtrooms. So sentencing hearings to see, did a judge ask about ability to, hear, uh, to pay? <laughs> did, uh, you know, what did the judge ask about other expenses uh, and employment? Um, and also what happened when a person was summoned to court and said they couldn't pay? Did the judge give them any other opportunity like community service? Um, and then we also, the aim was to identify court automated debt, debt so we could do statistical analyses across the states. Um, and we were actually successful with Minnesota. Chris has a, a really good data set within Minnesota and we're doing analysis and, and also in Washington state. So that's forthcoming research um, that we have. I wanna highlight really quickly two projects um, that have come out of this. One is really looking at in Seattle Municipal Court and disparities in traffic stops. So in, 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 with my collaborator, Frank Edwards, um, we found that people in Seattle are sentenced to criminal traffic cases. They tended to have legal financial obligations. So open debt, uh, open for longer periods of time compared to other types of cases. 
and for each class of case, <clears throat> black men and women were significantly more likely than their peers to be sentenced to incarceration through a Washington state superior court following paid and unpaid Seattle municipal court legal financial obligations. What does that mean? So it means that when people had a traffic citation, we looked downstream and traffic citation in a muni court, right? And we found statistical significance for folks subsequently, particularly black people being sentenced to prison in a Washington state superior court. Um, and then we also found that people of color had a higher likelihood than white people to be charged with a DWLS3, a driving with a license suspended in third degree following a uh, Seattle Municipal Court legal financial obligation sentence. And this was especially pronounced for black drivers. So really what we found is that the Muni court via traffic stop, so policing, right? And surveillance really was a gateway drug, if you will, to their further prosecution in more severe systems. So it's an interesting mechanism where we can see how uh, local police practices feed into more severe punishment disproportionately for black drivers in Seattle. And then the third piece um, that we're looking at, in my book, I really sort of argue that monetary sanctions exacerbate and create poverty for individuals. And I really wanted to explore how does this matter for communities and neighborhoods? Um, and so with our Washington State data, I worked with two great um, graduate students. And we this is a real descriptive study. We, we did find that you can identify, so legal financial obligations, that debt per capita is spatially concentrated. You can identify these debt block neighborhoods that owe significant amounts of debt to the state. In addition, higher poverty neighborhoods tended to have higher per capita LFO debt burdens. So impoverished communities, owed more debt to the state. And then finally, we wanted to see, well, what does this mean? Does it really exacerbate? Does this political intervention, this state policymaker sat up in their capitals and made these decisions to impose debt to individuals, does that intervention exacerbate poverty? And so we found that three years later, um, legal financial obligations are associated with increases in future poverty rates, and this association is stronger in non-white neighborhoods. So in communities of color, LFOs exacerbate poverty. Um, and I just threw this map in really quickly because we had an early morning conversation with Anna. This is, if you know Seattle, um, this is Lake Washington. This is North Seattle, where typically because of residential segregation that we have and, and racial covenants, usually uh, or typically from the history of Seattle, right here is the central district and south of that are communities of color. Basically, the darker the block shows a higher track level of poverty. So more, more poverty and higher per capita LFO debt burden. So if you're in a dark, uh, census tract here, it shows that your your neighborhood is, is impoverished and owes a lot of debt to the state. And if you know Seattle, this is where folks of color live. This is where African American, uh, South uh, Pacific Islander, uh, Asian American, Latinx populations live all through these corridors here. Um, and so we want to talk a little bit about policy reform. I'm not going to read through this, but there's a lot of stuff happening right now. I mean, really states and local jurisdictions are moving, especially in the juvenile realm. So this all is imposed, these fines and fees and costs are imposed to minors and their parents. Um, so there's been a, lot, a move to, to, particularly in California, to discontinue the imposition um, of fines and fees on minors. Um, in Washington, we had clarification regarding um, indigent homeless uh, folks and mentally ill people, but that's only for discretionary costs. We still have mandatory mandatory costs. So even if you're you're declared homeless, you still owe 500 per felony conviction, 250 for each misdemeanor. Um, and we can come back to this in Q and A. Routes to abolition. I mean, so there's been a lot of uh, incremental change. I believe we need to abolish the system of monetary sanctions. We can't have a just financial punishment system in a, in a society that's so full of racial and economic inequality. It just it's, will never be fair. But there's discussion about how we can make this work and, and sort of steps to get to the elimination of the system. Um, okay, quickly my reflections. There's three points I wanna make. One is that this is a unique punishment option. And I say it's an option. Our, our, our policymakers um, purposefully do this. It's not a collateral consequence, but a purposeful one. So it's there's a punishment is one aim. It's to hold people accountable in some, some form. And then it's revenue generation. I mean, it's a stated aim across all of our states to say we need to generate revenue off the backs of the people we process. 
Um, and the consequences, like I said, it's a two-tiered system of justice. It's more intense uh, surveillance and control. Um, there's tons of lim uh, related consequences, a term of liminal legality. So people are in the middle of being full citizens in terms of the right to vote. We saw that with Amendment 4 in Florida with the right to drive. And it's indeterminate and painful punishment. It blocks current and future opportunities with the debt. It restricts immediate life chances. Um, for people to even access health care, food, and child care, and it becomes an internalized punishment for many individuals. The second point is that we can think about debt as moral making and marking. Chris Eugen and his work and other scholars such as Diva Pager have talked about the permanent consequences as marks, stains, the stickiness of the stigma of spoiled identities. So the um, both the felony conviction and the uh, in, indissolvable debt, you can't declare bankruptcy, that becomes a stain for individuals in our society, this further mark in society that people carry attached to notions of account accountability and personal responsibility. And so what this means is, is that poor people can never be held accountable. They can never, you know, be redeemed in our society. And it really uh, creates this mark or this line between who is deserving of redemption in our society. It creates a moral high ground that poor people can never reach. And then third, I really want us to think about this notion of colorblind um, punishment within racially disparate outcomes. Uh, Professor Eduardo Bonilla Silver writes about colorblind racism a lot and writes that racial inequality as the outcome of non-racial dynamics. Uh, racial inequality is reproduced through new racism. Uh, practices that are subtle, institutional, and apparently non-racial, and that's exactly what monetary sanctions are. We see huge racial uh, disparities in criminal legal contact and processing. Um, there's potential disparities. We're still sussing this out in data analysis, um, but there's definitely disparities in debt burden uh, at the neighborhood level. And so monetary sanctions, then I just can't see my <laughs> what I, what I want to say down here, uh, political, economic, socially controlling tool of the state. It extracts wealth from communities. Um, and so I'll end here with, I, uh, you know, with our representative John Lewis and his memory about good, good trouble. Do not get lost in a sea of despair, right? This is hard stuff we're talking about. Be hopeful, be optimistic. Our struggle is not the struggle of a day, a week, a month, or a year. It is a struggle of a lifetime. Never ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. Um, I want to note that courageous conversations will not dismantle the white supremacy and structural racism that we saw last Wednesday. We need real structural change, institutional change, um, and policy reform. And we need to commit to doing this and not just symbolically. So thank you for listening. And I'll, turn, I'll stop sharing my screen. OK, good. I did that. Alexis, thank you so much for that presentation. I, I think um, it, you know, at the conference you you covered some of these topics, and and um, it's great to see the actual slides, and, and I, I know people appreciate that. Um, I think your your closing is just is spot on. Is that is that courageous conversations isn't going to solve this isn't going to solve this problem? There's lots of work that needs to be done, and you know sometimes we feel like we're sprinting towards change. Sometimes it feels like a marathon. As an organizer, you know, I, I've experienced both. And um, I'm just excited that we get to, you know, talk about some opportunities for change here uh, in Minnesota today. And thank you for the, providing that wonderful context. Um, I just want to remind people that you can put questions, that you can uh, put questions in, in the uh, Q&A section. Um, please don't hesitate. Uh, we we want we didn't get a chance to engage with folks back since, back in November as much, and so um, I would love to see lots of questions. There is a current question right now about uh, ignition interlock, and just because we're a little bit ahead of time, um, Alexis, I wonder if you'd be interested in responding to this. Uh, ignition interlock is um, is you, you know if you have a DUI and uh, you have to use this device um, and I didn't know this, but apparently you have to pay for it. And so this individual is saying that they haven't actually uh, had a DUI since 1994, <laughs> but because of their record uh, from 25 to 30 years ago, they're required under Minnesota law to have uh, this expensive device for six years. Um, is this something uh, that your research is, is uh, looking at? Definitely, I have a paper, um, I'll, when I can figure it out, I'll put it in the chat. Uh, or somewhere uh, that I can send to you with two amazing grad students where we look at just that issue. We look at both JPay in Washington State Department of Corrections and then the ignition, well, what happens when you have a DUI in Seattle Municipal Court and the costs. 
it, what I want is many states do, or jurisdictions do impose costs for DUI, um, the fine, and then impose the uh, ignition interlock device. And that's the device that you have to blow into to start your car. So you have to pay, and this, this highlights a really, I think a point that uh, is important. It highlights all of the ways in which private entities are embedded within our state and local uh, courts. Uh, and people are able to generate revenue and profits off of people who make contact with our courts. So you pay for that device, a big chunk at the get go, but then you pay monthly, right? To rent that device and to have that monitor thing happen. So if, it, if you're poor, it means you can't drive, right? You can't afford that device. Um, so we really need to th think about why and how do we let these private folks come in, these entrepreneurs come into our courts and, and generate profits off of us. There's no monitoring of how much profits they're making. Um, we just moved in Washington state to post contracts uh, in of DOC vendors, right? So, so at least public can see what the contracts are and what the costs are, um, but we need more transparency in that realm. Thank you. And once again, it's always responsible to look at how your tax dollars are being spent and who's benefiting and who's deciding. Um, I wanna uh, pass, thank you, for, thank you for that. I want, uh, Alexis, I wanna just, uh, frame a uh, queue up Chris uh, to offer some remarks on uh, what we're doing here locally in, in Minnesota. Um, so Chris, take it away. Thank you, Justin. And it's a real honor to follow Dr. Harris. Um, I, I hope people realize she is the national expert on this subject and, and uh, it's, it's uh, a formidable task to follow her, but I'll do my best to give some local context. Um, Team Minnesota here on this project is uh, uh, Rob Stewart, who many of you know, uh, uh, Veronica Horowitz, Ryan Larson, and several uh, uh, terrific undergraduate students. Um, as Alexis mentioned, we looked at administrative data from the state court administrative administrator's office. We did interviews with debtors, uh, uh, defendants, and, and court actors like prosecutors and judges in six counties. And we did a couple hundred hours of court observations as well um, around Minnesota. And I'll just give a few highlights and, and uh, 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 perhaps at a later date, I, I, can, I can present you know, full papers, findings, et cetera. Um, let me just say Minnesota, at the outset that Minnesota uh, criminal justice debt is kind of moderate in the context of the other states. Uh, that is, so we compared, for example, the, the, the total criminal justice debt around driving with suspended license, um, which ended up around $300 in Minnesota. It could be over a thousand in, in, in some other states. And so at the outset, we said, well, the uh, levels here are not uh, extreme by national standards. That said, there is an urgent need for reform, and I can't emphasize this enough based on our debtor interviews and based on the lived experience of this debt. Um, the other issue, I, 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 uh, picking up on what uh, Dr. Harris said, that, that the per capita burden of, of monetary sanctions is quite a bit higher in uh, uh, Hennepin and Ramsey County. Um, in part, this is because there are a ton of parking and traffic offenses and other, other real low level stuff that, that, at, that uh, 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 increases that, that per capita burden. Um, the per case burden is, is actually higher in greater Minnesota. That is so that if we just look at what the total uh, criminal justice debt is around a particular offense, uh, a, a single offense for an individual, that is going to look higher, uh, 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 quite a bit higher outside of Ramsey, Hennepin County and, and the, the, the metro area. Um, so it's not, it's not simply an urban issue. Um, the, the other issue I, I would say is that we've been able to do in Minnesota that's a little, a little different and we're hoping to develop in the next few years is we've matched the, co the court debt database with the uh, child support database. And we can find that what we call dual debtors, the people who owe in both systems, really get hammered by this system. And in fact, the criminal justice debt seems to increase the arrears or how far behind people are falling on their child support debt. And, and so this, this seems to be a real cost of the system that hasn't really been considered yet. Um, 
what did we learn from our interviews with with debtors? Well, well, we clearly heard in in several cases that people increase their criminal behavior in part to pay off their 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 monetary sanctions. Uh, that is, is selling drugs to raise money so that they can get their driver's license back uh, and and begin work. Uh, uh, and th and this not only do people adjust their criminal behavior, but they do adjust their work behavior. That is that some people told us they were taking cash jobs because they wanted to avoid losing their tax refund. Um, but more often we heard things about uh, uh, how the, the uh, uh, suspension of the driver's license limited their ability to travel and to work, uh, which particularly outside of the Twin Cities Metro was it was an enormous barrier. Um, the, the another issue that, that didn't come across in our administrative data, but we see we heard real loud and clear talking to people is that if you owe in multiple counties, the, the debt becomes quickly overwhelming and, and impossible to kind of sort through. So people honestly didn't know what they owed uh, uh, and, and they were overwhelmed by it. And, and I wanted to point to this, uh, what, what Alexa said uh, about uh, having these restoration days uh, uh, or, or reconsideration days, uh, it seems so important here. And, and if there's one thing that I would love to see, it was some sort of amnesty or expungement, this would make a huge difference to individuals. Uh, I also have to say in Minnesota uh, uh, that, that we've got to consider the, these, this uh, criminal justice debt in, con in connection with confinement. Uh, in part because we have to look at the whole punishment picture that, that in some cases, people who get relatively low monetary sanctions, particularly in Hennepin County, will get higher rates of confinement. That is, their bodies will be, will be punished uh, uh, in, 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 rather than their, the piling, up, piling up the debt. And so, you, so that we, we get, we've got to eliminate the debt, but also hold the line on any kind of confinement or, or uh, probation terms. Uh, what did we hear from court decision makers and judges? Well, I tell you, it's not as, uh, uh, they're not necessarily uh, oriented to monetary sanctions debt. It's not nearly as much on the radar as is the in or out uh, 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 prison decision. Um, and we have greater uniformity around the state of Minnesota than in other states. In Georgia, for example, uh, the states are all across, or the counties are all across the board. Uh, Minnesota, we have a unified court system. The most of the money returns to the state general fund. So that is that uh, uh, there, there isn't nearly the local incentive to jack, jack up the, uh, uh, the criminal justice debt. But that means that gives us, uh, I'd, I'd say, much more leverage in terms of reform. That is, we, we reform the state. We don't have to necessarily reform each county individually uh, by itself. So, so in terms of needs, I'll just stop there that uh, uh, the routine suspension of driver's license is, is, uh, uh, is brutal. We've been hearing that loud and clear. We've got to consider debt in other systems like the child support system and move toward uh, uh, some kind of reconsideration. Thank you. Chris, thank you so much for framing that up. And there's clearly so much work is being done here in Minnesota and there's so much opportunities. Um, next, I want to have Anna just speak a, about uh, the fines and fees work specifically that the Asset Buildings Coalition is doing and remind people, you know, once again, the comments, I see lots of comments, feel free to, there's pe more people at, uh, putting questions in the Q&A um, and uh, um, I just want to you know, make sure folks uh, continue to engage. This is great. Anna, please uh, share with about your effort. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah, my name is Anna Odegaard. I work with the Minnesota Asset Building Coalition, um, which is a coalition of nonprofit organizations across the state of Minnesota, primarily direct service providers that are working directly with communities, um, low income folks who are really striving for financial stability, working with communities of color that are facing additional barriers to asset building opportunities. Um, and sometimes when I start talking about our criminal justice reform initiatives, people will ask, well, why would an asset building coalition be interested in criminal justice reform? That that connection isn't, um, isn't intuitive for a lot of folks. And so what I talk about is how folks within our coalition about four or five years ago started talking about the way that fines and fees in the criminal justice system function as an asset stripping system within the exact communities where our member organizations are really working on building asset building opportunities. 
Um, and so listening to Dr. Harris a little earlier talk about the way those fines and fees hit particular communities is exactly why an asset building coalition is concerned about the fines and fees in the criminal justice system. Another reason we're working on criminal justice reform is because the model of MABC really is to work on connecting individuals in communities that are experiencing certain barriers or challenges, connecting those folks to legislators, to policymakers that can do the actual systems change um, to change the environment and the systems within which people are struggling. Um, and so we have member organizations in every legislative district across the state of Minnesota um, and my job really uh, is twofold. I work with my members to put together a legislative agenda every year um, with our top priorities. And then I make, I get appointments with legislators and then invite, invite our members from that legislator's district um, so that we can connect folks from districts that are struggling with particular issues to their legislator to talk about um, what those challenges are and to talk about the solutions. Um, I think Kevin a little bit later is going to talk a little bit about some listening sessions that he led um, with folks who have been struggling to pay off fines and fees um, and the real interest among those individuals to be part of the solution, to be talking to policymakers about what they can do um, to make sure that people aren't trapped in this catch-22 of fines and fees. Um, and so that is one of the things MABC, the Asset Building Coalition, um, is working on doing. I want to, um, you know, we've, we've seen, we've heard some data about um, kind of uh, across the nation. I do want to just show you a couple of maps we put together to show you what's happening in Minnesota. Um, and these are specifically maps that were designed to demonstrate the correlation between driver's license suspensions for unpaid traffic tickets, which is an issue we've heard about already this morning a couple of times, um, and communities of color and low income communities. Um, so as folks in my coalition started talking about the issue of fines and fees, it became clear pretty quickly that driver's license suspension is a point of escalation for a lot of low income individuals. Escalation of debt, because once your license is suspended, you have a real tough choice between um, stopping driving and likely losing your job or significantly decreasing your income or continuing to drive and accumulating ticket after ticket for driving after suspension, which as uh, Professor Yugen just pointed out is a $300 ticket in Minnesota. Uh, so, um, we realized that it was an escalation of debt, but it was also an escalation of interactions with the criminal justice system. Um, and so we really focused on driver's license suspension as an area of high priority reform. So I'm, I wanna share my screen for just a minute here, if I can. Um, we practiced this earlier, so hopefully this will work. Um, yeah. So actually, I'm gonna show you this one first. Let me just ask, um, can somebody give me a nod? Do you see a map of Minnesota that's purple shades? Okay, I've got some thumbs up. Fantastic. Um, so this is a map of Minnesota by zip code, and you can see the large square um, cutout is uh, the Twin City metro area. What we asked, this is the legislative ge uh, geographic information systems office put these maps together for us. We asked them to put together three maps by zip code that would demonstrate, that would show the percent of driver's licenses in that zip code that are suspended a second map that would show the percent of people by zip code that are BIPOC, um, that are people of color. And then a third map that would show folks living below the poverty level. So really show low income communities. And so this is what I wanna show you. This first map is um, shows the darker shades show sh higher um, percentages of BIPOC individuals living in the zip code. Um, and I just wanna show you like, so in the Twin Cities metro area here, you can really see um, the east side of St. Paul um, the north side of Minneapolis and some of these northern Minneapolis suburbs where we have significant communities of color. If you look at the Minnesota state map, you'll notice these real dark shades around the state. And I actually asked the GIS folks if they would label our Native American communities around the state. Um, and so you can see we have the Red, Red Lake um, Reservation here in Beltrami, the White Earth Reservation in Becker County, um, Leech Lake Reservation. Um, and so you can see we have concentrations of people of color in our Native American communities around the state. And then a couple other ones here, if you look for instance in Worthington, which has a pretty significant immigrant population, um, we also see these concentrations of people in co of color around the state. Now I am going to do a magic switch here and I'm gonna pop up a map for folks living um, beneath the poverty level in Minnesota. And you'll see a real correlation here again, east side of St. Paul, north side of Minneapolis. And you can actually, we don't have, um, 
the Native American um, reservations labeled on this, but you can actually see, sorry, I wanted to pop up one more map here real quick that I thought I had up, but I don't, so I'm gonna pop it up real quick here. Um, maps. Okay. Here we go. Okay, so here we have, so here was our BIPOC population map. And you'll see some correlations with our communities of um, living below 125% of poverty. But the map I really want to show you is our suspended licenses map. So if you look at the same areas I was just talking about, the east side of St. Paul, you see these dark colors showing a high level of license suspensions, the north side of Minneapolis, these northern suburbs. Um, and then interestingly, and this is what we really didn't know before we put these maps together, you can literally look at this map of Minnesota, look at these dark colors. There's Becker County, there's Beltrami County. These are our Native American communities where we see these dark colors, as well as Worthington down here. You can literally track our communities of color, track the communities of color around the state by looking at where we have high levels of license suspension. So I don't want to belabor that. I think for most people on this call, that maybe is obvious um, that that would be true. It's certainly not obvious. I want to make sure that we talk about this. It is not obvious for many of our legislators. I'm going to stop sharing our screen there. Um, and so it's one of the things we really talk about with legislators that this is an issue that's particularly hitting our BIPOC communities. Um, so uh, why is that happening? Uh, Dr. Harris talked a little bit about that. Um, I do wanna just to make it state specific, I wanna talk about a study that was done a couple of years ago in St. Paul. Um, those of you who read the local papers, maybe, and I, I assume many people on the call this morning are uh, Minneapolis folks or St. Paul folks. Um, there was a study in St. Paul a couple of years ago that showed that people of color are twice as likely to be pulled over for a traffic stop as whites in the city of St. Paul. Um, and so what we see is that communities of color are particularly burdened by traffic ticket debt and then the license suspension that actually that often comes after that, um, both because of policing practices and patterns that um, result in folks of color having more tickets for the same driving behavior. Um, as well as people in those communities often lacking the assets to pay off those tickets. Um, so we started reaching out to people that we thought would be interested in this. We started working with um, the city prosecutors of Minneapolis and St. Paul. We started working with the state public defender and then a whole bunch of community groups that were interested in this issue. So Race, uh, Voices for Racial Justice has been an incredibly important partner. Um, the Joint Religious Legislative Coalition, there are a number of faith-based groups that are interested in this. And we put together a couple of bills. And that's what I want to talk about with my last couple of minutes here. So we have two bills that we have been talking to legislators at, about at the, minute, the um, state capitol in St. Paul. One of them is more focused on the fines and fees generally and some of the things Dr. Harris talked about, um, about uh, assessing ability to pay. So we have a bill that would require judges across the state of Minnesota to assess ability to pay before imposing any sentence that includes fines, fees, or surcharges. Um, and it would actually also give judges more discretion than they have now to reduce or waive fines or fees or offer community service option in lieu of those fines, fees, and surcharges. Um, the second bill, separate, uh, would, is a very straightforward bill. It would end driver's license suspensions for unpaid traffic tickets. So when we talk to legislators, I'm very clear that we put together, this was in conjunction with the state public defender and our city prosecutors. Um, it's been endorsed by the Minnesota County Attorneys Association. We put together what we thought was a balanced bill. So unpaid traffic tickets would still be sent to collections, which they are currently, as we've talked about. So there's an accountability mechanism to make sure that the state gets the dollars from those tickets. What it would do though is stop the driver's license suspension that tends to really escalate debt and escalate interactions with the criminal justice system for those folks who are unable to pay off that traffic ticket. So those are the two bills that we're working on. Um, and I wanna tell you just real briefly about um, a couple of our allies and a couple of the obstacles because I think the obstacles, the challenges we face are really telling in terms of how these fines and fees and license suspensions function for the state of Minnesota, and I know also in many other states. Um, so our allies are folks in the court system. They're folks in community organizations. Um, they are, as I mentioned, the Minnesota County Attorneys Association. We were recently endorsed by the Minnesota State Bar Association. So there's a, a kind of growing policy consensus around ending driver's license suspensions for unpaid traffic tickets. So why it hasn't, it, and, and I actually should be very specific to say, we have many Democrats and many Republicans who have signed onto these bills. So it's not explicitly a partisan issue in Minnesota either. Um, right now, because we have a majority of Republicans in the Senate, we have a Republican chief author in the Senate. 
We have majority Democrats in the House. We have a Democrat chief author in the House. Both of those are great champions of these bills. So why hasn't it been able to get passed? And I wanna be really specific about this. There's something called a fiscal note. Any bill that's introduced to the legislature um, is sent to the agency that would be responsible for implementing that bill. And that agency does an estimate of what it would cost the state if the bill passed and became law. Um, and so the driver's license suspension bill, we know would result in about 112,000 fewer driver's license suspensions per year. That's a lot of people who don't lose their license and don't lose their job and are able to take care of their family and maintain their income. But also in the state of Minnesota, if your license has been suspended, in order to have that license reinstated, after you've paid off all your court debt, you go to driver and vehicle services office and you pay a $20 reinstatement fee to have your license reinstated. Well, for our first, first fiscal note, what we found out, what came back was they took that 112,000, the number of fewer suspensions per year if this bill passes, they multiplied it by 20, which is the cost of a re the reinstatement fee, um, which ends up being about $2.4 million. And they said, well, that's the cost of this bill. In other words, the state will lose $2.4 million in revenue from reinstatement fees if we stop suspending these licenses. Another way to say that is we just can't afford to stop suspending driver's licenses because then we can't collect $20 per suspension in reinstatement fees. We have had a lot of conversations with legislators and other policymakers about the fact that we cannot be raising revenue through reinstatement fees on driving licenses and trying to demonstrate the cost to families, to employers, to communities, to our tax base when people lose their jobs because of a driver's license suspension. We also pointed out that many of those reinstatement fees do not get paid. As we've heard from Professor Yugen, from Dr. Harris, many people simply cannot pay those and they go without a license for years. So we did ask them to go back and recalculate not $20 times the number of suspensions, but how much revenue is actually generated by those reinstatement fees. Um, and it ended up being about 350,000, significantly less, which just tells you the magnitude of defaults on those license suspensions. So I think I've taken up my time. I am gonna stop. Uh, I am gonna do one other thing. I'm gonna put my email in the chat. What I do is I help connect people who care about this issue to their own legislators to talk about why it's so important to stop suspending driver's licenses for unpaid court debt. If you are interested in getting involved, send me an email. We'll figure out, you know, we, I, I, I can help you kind of prep and make sure that you're comfortable and confident before you come in to talk to a legislator. Um, and I will literally do that meeting with you so that I can kind of be the policy expert and you can talk about how it impacts you, your family, your community. I would love to hear from you. So I'm going to put my email in the chat um, and I think I'm passing it now to Kevin, who is a staff at Voices for Racial Justice, which I mentioned earlier, has been a really important partner in the work that we're doing. Thank you, Anna. <clears throat> Kevin? Yeah, uh, thank you, Anna. Thank all of y'all. As I'm sitting here thinking about this amazing coalition of people that's here this morning talking about this particular issue, and we're here under this lens of a pound of flesh. And I'd be remiss if I'm not thinking about the actual people that the flesh come from, right? Those people are people that I know and what that looks like and feels like. So when we're talking about the actual impact of mass incarceration, right? The, the financial impact, the financial woes that mass incarceration has on our communities. First, you know, um, last time I spoke a little bit about it, but I, I keep coming back to the number of just with minimum wage in 14 years and eight months, over $400,000, right? Was taken out of my family, like not having an opportunity to be able to bring that income into my home, into my family, into my community, right? The ripple effect of that is unknown, who knows the ripple effect of that, but I could tell you that it was not good. Chris, you spoke about something earlier that I wanna come back to. Yes, like it's not just the actual financial world that you face, it's your body being taken away for time. It's that thing that you can't replace. It's the thing that no matter, you can't get it back, you can't duplicate You know the role of us being back in our communities, the role that we will play just naturally being back in this space. So as an organizer, I spent my last, well, my whole entire bit, I was pretty much around amazing man who were doing community organizing. And this is one of the things that would always come up and come out of our conversations around the current way that the Minnesota Department of Corrections is set up. It's, it's set up in the thing that we call the silent violence. And the silent violence is the financial aspect of it, where you are literally taken away from the community and you are held sort of ransom, hostage from your family. So if your family wanna to talk to you, they have to pay. 
if your family want to make sure that you eat and you're able to have some of the bare necessities that you need to be able to withstand that horrible experience, they have to pay in order for them to like have something in place for you when you come home. So you have an opportunity for first chance, you know, for a lot of folks, you know, I don't like to use the word second chance sometimes, uh, first chance for a lot of folks, they have to pay, they have to pull this money and pull these resources out of places that they currently don't have. So yes, earlier, um, I'm director of criminal justice at Voices for Racial Justice as well too. And over last year, we, was, we held some listening sessions with the city of St. Paul around fines and fees and what the impact of that looks like. You know, of course, we heard a bunch of horrible stories about how, you know, not having their license is impacting folks' ability to work. Child support, sending brothers to jail because they don't have a job. They like, I'm, well, I don't want to not pay my child support to take care of my kids. And the answer for them, for fathers who are already feeling the heat of not being able to provide for their children, our system tell them, we'll send you to jail too, right? So we did a listening session with these folks and we heard some of these horrific stories. But one of the biggest things that came out was the desire for the folks to be connected on a continuing basis, because so many of our folks in the community feel marginalized from these type of conversations. They care, they are impacted, but they don't necessarily know where to go because they have been told that these things happen to you, not through you or for you. So opening up the space and realizing we need to have a, a community that's more politically engaged, more civically engaged, understanding their power, understanding the power of each other, the power of their vote, the power of their ability to organize within their own communities to actually impact this change that's continuing to happen to them and through them generation after generation after generation. So when, we're, when I think of mass incarceration, I think of the cold cell that you actually sleep in, but I also think about the profiteering right, how much every person within that system is actually getting paid on your body being in that system in one form or another, or you are just literally paying, paying a system for them to not send you to jail, essentially, anytime you owe fines and fees, the, the, the back end, why you're paying is because you don't necessarily want to go to jail, and when we, we live in this country, um, with the democracy, I know that there has to be a better way in which we can deal with our citizens instead of imposing actual jail restrictions on our citizens for being poor, for being marginalized, for being traumatized, for being everything like the conditions and some of the max that they show. I know I'm particularly, I'm from here from Minneapolis, so particularly the one Anna showed. Yes, it breaks my heart when you see, yes, the concentrated um, bodies of poverty in, in the communities that I know, what the folks that I know that look like me, skin tone similar to me, stories are similar to me, that we continue to be in every poverty stricken map you see in the country, like in every poll that we continue to be the last, the lost, the least. And as long as we continue to have that, we're going to continue to have to have spaces like this when we bring folks together to have these conversations. But for me, I'm um, thinking about what does it look like for us to move past these conversations and move past to actually implement actual change. And I think the actual change that we need to make, nothing about the criminal justice system should involve poor people having to pay this system to not send them to prison, right? It's a tragedy in itself. Nothing about the criminal justice system should involve innocent families, right? Whoever the loved one may be who may be convicted of a crime, right? Innocent families to have to pay these egregious amounts of money to talk to their families, right? To make sure that their family, their loved ones have what they need to make it through this middle passage that we like to call incarceration. And then on the other end in community, we would love to see that our folks who are trying to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, because that's what America told us we need to do to pull ourselves up by the, our bootstraps, stop cutting the shoestrings by giving people these fines and these fees that they can't even pay. They're, it's not even considered if this person can afford to pay this, like they ain't even run their credit in the courtroom, it would be clear we are we are heaping this person with an amount of debt that this person cannot pay. So on the back end of that, when this person cannot pay, we know that we will continue to reap benefits all the way down. So if they have nothing else, we will take their body, right? So that's why I call it the silent violence because they don't really say it, but they do it and you feel it. And if you don't pay, they'll send you to jail. You don't pay, you can't talk to your family. You don't pay, like the consequences on the other side of it is, is always hard for communities of color. Yo, brother Kevin, I really appreciate you, man. And I think, um, 
you know, you brought up democracy. And I think what when you said that, it reminded me that um, some days it's hard to know which is more influential in our society, democracy or capitalism. <clears throat> because if you think about, you know, the voice of the people being related to democracy and what the people need um, when harm is caused in communities, and you think about the profits <laughs> on the capitalist side, it seems like we are much more motivated to govern based on profits than, than on the voice of the people. And, and I just, I appreciate you for always adding your voice and for speaking for the brothers that I know that are still locked down, that you still stay connected to and for the families, man. And I just, I, I wanna say thank you. Um, you said that bootstrap, they said they, they need to stop cutting shoestrings, huh? <laughs> That's right. All right. Um, so we need to wrap up here and there's several uh, really good questions in the queue. So I'm gonna try to get through some of these. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left in this discussion. So to the panelists, I'm gonna ask you to keep your remarks bumper sticker, you know, the, you know, the, the quick witty, quick witty response. Um, we've heard a lot of research and data. Um, and so just know that you've already said that. <laughs> so just make your point and, uh, and, and get in and get out. So uh, let's see. Um, so I want to go to uh, uh, Catherine's question here. Sorry, I'm, my mouse is backwards, so I'm like scrolling the wrong direction. Um, <clears throat> good grief. All right. I'm sorry, we're going to go to Rachel's question. What strategies do you prioritize as an alternative to fines and fees for minor violations? And I think Catherine's question kind of um, builds on top of this. So this, the first part is, Priorities as an alternative to fines, uh, fines uh, for more for minor violations, and then the second is like what impacts on lives of people uh, do these reforms have when they've been implemented in different places? And so I think um, uh, I'm gonna call on folks to respond. So um, when it comes to strategies, prioritize as an alternative to fines and fees. Um, since Anna, you have the live bill here in Minnesota, I'm wondering if you have a response to that. Remember a uh, bumper sticker and I'll try to be quicker on my setups as well. Yep, just a couple of things. So currently, if you don't pay your traffic ticket, there are two penalties, the fine and the, the fees and surcharges that get sent to collections and a driver's license suspension. So part of what we're trying to do is eliminate the redundancy of the penalty. But secondly, we all know a $300 fine is not the same to every family. For some folks, it's an inconvenience, for some people, it may mean very little. And for some, it's a total deal breaker. They don't have it anywhere in their budget. So partly we're also, that's why we have the bill around ability to pay so that judges are right sizing fines to a penalty that makes sense for that individual, which for some people literally may be very, very small. Um, I think Dr. Harris talked a little bit about the day fine system in England where you pay a percentage of your daily income as a fine recognizing that $10 may be just as much a hardship for some folks as 500 is for others. Thank you. Uh, does anyone want to add to this, maybe cover the um, uh, what kind of impact reforms are having on people's lives? Because I think that's a really important question. I wonder, Dr. Harris, do you have a response to that? We had a series of reconsideration days in different counties in Washington state uh, in 2019. And just anecdotally, because I haven't gotten in and studied it uh, yet, people feel relieved. Um, they're, they're not, they don't have that weight hanging over their head that they're gonna be arrested. Um, and so just taking that off the table and, and making uh, the costs realistic. Although I do wanna say, and I wanna push back just a little bit, I have a good colleague, Jeff Selbin, and he always says we can't right size justice right, in terms of economic inequality. And so I think we need to really move to abolition. Um, we need incremental changes to help people right in the moment, but we need to move to abolition. Thank you so much. Um, and I will just take this opportunity to shout out the NAACP and other organizations that have worked on warrant forgiveness uh, in, in the Twin Cities area, um, ACLU, lots of partners. We've seen that have a, a huge impact on people's lives as well. Uh, so here's a question from Maria. Um, what are the primary sources of data in Minnesota and Hennepin County that I can track down to understand how this issue is being handled by my jurisdiction? Chris, do you have a response to this? Yeah, I think the uh, Minnesota State Court Administrator's Office is, is uh, uh, our, partic our source of data. Uh, Hennepin County, we, we looked at budget documents to try to track things down and we saw things like the library fine system as well. Um, I, I would say in Hennepin County, the story is variability though. I have to, I, I do have to say that within some courtrooms, 
uh, uh, judges are, are, are very sensitive to this issue and very responsive, and, and, but that doesn't hold across the board. Thank you, Chris. Um, Catherine has another question on here, um, and I normally wouldn't give uh, double time to one person, but I want to be real. This is a good question. So uh, where can we find info on how much revenue is generated through these various uh, charges, fines, et cetera, and who is benefiting from the revenue? I will also say, I know Ella Baker Center out of Oakland, California did a report on who pays um, a few years ago that I found was really uh, interesting. I'd love to see something like that here that maybe the MJRC can take on. Um, does anyone have a, a, have a, Chris, I feel like this might be a, Chris and Alexis, this might be a good question for you. Um, just as far as like who's benefiting from the revenue. I, I have to say just it's it it is really complicated Justin it is, it is like uh, uh, tracking down in different documents and and I would say that that some of the the best studies have been done in places like New Orleans uh, uh, we've we've got the, the Brennan Center in New York has, has done some some good work and and Alexis has a link to the fines and fees Justice Center um, and they've got some expert lawyers and and budget analysts who've kind of looked at different places but I think we can apply those methodologies in Minnesota um, Kevin, can I put you on the spot for that, for that same question? Um, when you're, when you're, when you're, uh, were incarcerated, uh, a resident of one of the, uh, uh, prisons here in Minnesota, where did you see your money going? Out of my pocket first, from, from, from my family first. Um, so they have these budgets that they come out and they give and they say the money go to the gym equipment, to the phones, to the, to the, um, television programming, um, to, to things such as that. But what happens is it's, there, it's a no, it has no ceiling in Minnesota. It's a thing called FCC, I mean, the cost of confinement. And the cost of confinement has no ceiling, right? There's no floor to it. It's an ongoing expense. They take bare minimum. If you owe no fines and fees and restitution and stuff here in the state of Minnesota, if you owe that, it's up to 25% of your money they're going to take. But if you even owe none, like you said, Chris, just your body, you owe no fines, no fees, no restitution, you're just in a Minnesota prison. Every dollar you get, they're going to take 10%, right? So like one or two years, you're like, all right, maybe this 10% paying for the phones. But a decade in, you like, my 10% done pay for more than this. My 10% done sent some kids to college. I wish I could have sent mine. So where you see that money going, the transparency in that, it's like it's a myth, nobody really knows. And in that nobody really knowing, it's all of the trauma because there's no mistrust. And then historically we come from communities who are used to being our labor being exploited from us. So whatever I say would also be not fact because you know the, the numbers show, this is what y'all pay for. This is how much money y'all come in that comes in and there's a huge gap and we don't know where it goes. And then that is like mass incarceration here in Minnesota. Thank you, Kevin. So we're we're pretty much out of time. We need to wrap up. There's one more question that I do want to highlight for Anna. Anna, if you could share the bill numbers and uh, or even throw some links to those bills uh, that are moving out the Capitol in, in the chat, um, people have requested that. And I and I and I actually just want to double down on that and just say that you consider this a call to action. Um, it's one thing to join these conversations and get this data and do the research, um, but you never want to do a paralysis of the analysis. You know, sometimes we just think too damn hard. And the reality is that your legislators, as we find, we've seen in the recent weeks, like these people live in your community. They, they kids go to the same schools that you that your kids go to right now. They're all home, right? Unfortunately, it's it's, it's difficult. Um, but these are these they shop in your name they shop at your grocery store these people are your people and you need a part of your community and you need to talk to them so please don't feel like you need to read everything before you reach out and say can we please stop the silent violence and i just want you to remember the folks in this conversation and the people connected to us who are not part of this conversation or joined us today who are being impacted by this and don't hesitate to speak up for folks um you know, we did a report on snow emergency. Snow in Minnesota is um, not a shock for anyone. And we found that $300,000 was being taken out of low-income communities of color in St. Paul through for snow in Minnesota. This don't make no sense, y'all. And I think that we have to just start standing up and, and asking folks to make it make sense. Um, with that, I would just be, I wanna just say thank you 
uh, to my, our panelists. You guys are amazing. Thank you for agreeing to do this again. Um, apologies for the video issues we had during the conference. Um, on short notice, I want to say thank you to folks who showed up on short notice. We had 90 people on the call. Our goal was 100. I think our high point was 93. <laughs> um, so thank you for everyone who showed up uh, with last minute notice. I want to say thank you to Big um, uh, Bright Insights Global uh, for agreeing to put this together. Once again, just like turned it around within just a few days. And um, Jackie and Saida, your whole team is amazing on social media. Uh, and I'm, I'm just so appreciative for, for the work you guys have done. Um, if please, uh, the Minnesota Justice Research Center, we're a small, re uh, we're a small uh, research nonprofit with uh, one full-time staff, myself, and as we're building this organization out, uh, we really want to be able to relate uh, and be held accountable by the community to fund us so that we know that we are working in community as we develop our research. So please make a donation if you are able. Every little bit counts. We don't have any grants in the door right now, and we're, we're building this thing with community and with support. And so thank you for all the funders who have, have supported us, um, but really we, we do need that community support and so that we can build together. Um, with that, we are at time. I have so much more to say. I'm inspired to get back to work today. And uh, uh, thank you all for blessing us and sharing and building together in community. We'll be reviewing um, the comments and putting out uh, more videos in the next weeks to come. So thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank all y'all, y'all be stay please. Thanks, Thank you. Appreciate it. Good to see you all. Bye.